last chapter in um, the handbook is on um, DFMA, and in, in that it really talks about the kind of the lean um, techniques that um, Phil was just talking about then in manufacturing and the just-in-time concept, um, which I, is obviously one of the Toyota concepts. I was interested, um, Nanda particularly, or anyone from the panel, if Nanda doesn't uh, want to answer on this one, but I suppose in which other areas um, could lean techniques or lean construction, uh, where, where, I guess, where do, where do you see them taking off? Um, possibly looking back at the Crown Plaza project that you showed, but also where might these be um, taking place in future modular? That's too early. Um, what do you mean, lean tech? Lean? I suppose the, the lean techniques, which, and particularly the very last chapter, I was um, so impressed with the, I guess, the philosophy of, um, I guess, efficient uh, processes way beyond um, just base um, replication, just, just, just doing things faster. It's actually about kind of a technique of um, speed just in time. So in terms of production line, things that are, are um, queued or arrive just at that moment when it's needed. So mm. in the sense that obviously the Crown Plaza volumetric um, storage has a capacity, mm. um, but I suppose where, where is the future in that area? Well, uh, prefabric, uh, fabric, prefabrication requires a certain discipline from the designers and um, well, especially because everything has got to be locked down if you're going to start to make something, um, especially if it's a full fit out in a, in, a, in a structure, you need to procure everything virtually. You cannot, in a, in a building sequence, if you're doing a, a large building, um, you've got time lags to finish you prioritise different parts, whereas um, you need to be able to uh, order virtually um, things in a much faster uh, sequence, much tighter sequence, because things will be finished faster. So manufacturing and just-in-time purchasing and keeping very small inventories is what it's about. It's exactly what manufacturing does. It's exactly what the car industry did. It, be it becomes... Um, you know, it's a discipline that you have to adopt if you're going to go into those things or you, it falls apart. I think the, the lean construction way of thinking just so uh, suits modular <coughs> construction so inherently. Now, I've considered it previously for actually on a construction project where you're on site and because there are so many unknowns, because there's so little way that you control so many aspects, um, although you may try to, um, inevitably it never works out quite as you plan. Um, because you've got that greater degree of control in processing off-site, in fabricating off-site, uh, that's really where the lean construction, I see the greatest benefit for it, or the greatest opportunity at least. I might just throw a question in on, on that, um, and, and it's probably to Nanda again. Um, and obviously lean construction is the way, way to go, there's less waste, it's more sustainable, it's quicker, smaller inventory. Given that we, you know, first world countries like Australia couldn't support a car industry under lean construction, can we support a modular industry? Um, yeah, I think very much so. In, um, you're going to build in, this, in the country. You're not going to... And each country has got its own factors, different wage rates, different material costs. And the, the, answer, and the answer is not to just import everything. As you said, Phil, you, you know, moving things around, putting it on a truck, taking it to a port, lifting it from a port into a boat, and going through a typhoon to another place where you'd have to take it off the port, go through customs, put it on another truck, arrive on a site or even a holding yard. You look at the logistics of something like that, and it's a major it's a major cost in the whole process. So given the building components are so big, it makes sense that they stay local. Um, you know, cars are in a different category, or if you're shipping iPhones, you can put a gazillion of them in a container. But um, you saw on the back of those ships that were bringing the CIMC products, it's actually, and they're very big, they're very cumbersome, and it's very expensive. If you're paying five or ten thousand dollars to ship a container, or whatever you're paying, and it's full of iPhones, the component cost or the transport cost per unit of something small <clears throat> is uh, completely different to if it's a cost on a on a room, on a hotel room, for instance. So um, it's just logical to keep those to keep things uh, local, and uh, you be. Um, 
is uh, setting up a factory in in um, in Melbourne, in St Albans, because there's a commitment to be local, uh, to use local labour, uh, be part of a local industry, create jobs. I think it's something that. Um, you know, you're not going to export the benefits of your construction industry. It's politically unsustainable and I think socially very regressive and it's not something that uh, we believe in. I think, Phil, like you say, when there's the motivation for modular or to have a more efficient way of constructing, then it generally will get, it will find its way. Um, but the, I guess, more difficult situation is when there isn't that inherent uh, motivation and how do you then uh, make sure that designs are still evolving and still becoming more innovative. Uh, I think the handbook that we've developed gives a bit of assistance in that, a bit of guidance, um, but there needs to be a bit of courage and a bit of, um, I guess, uh, leadership within the industry to actually push through new designs, to accept them and to, to give them the patience to develop and, and come up with uh, solutions which we aren't doing now. And that means also sticking with modular and, and putting that forward as, as a preferred option. Um, can I add something to that? Because uh, design is very important to architects. They hold it very dearly. It's the sort of the reason that they exist. So if, um, if you have systems that are inflexible, for instance, um, uh, CIMC, the Chinese manufacturer, had a really strong business making shipping containers, so they said, well, how can we diversify? Well, they look like rooms, can't we make buildings? But they just used their existing technology and tried to apply to buildings. Uh, reasonably successful within limits, as Philip said, they can't, you can't build so high and you can't um, um, deal with other forces and things. But um, what we have been doing with... Um, is trying to uh, allow room, uh, well, almost unlimited room for design, for design input. So unless a system or a combination of components can produce buildings that architects want to build, <clears throat> modular won't work. If it's, going to limit, uh, if it's going to limit design, there will be insurmountable resistance. It'll just get ignored. So flexibility is uh, paramount. Um, I've, you've seen the buildings that, um, that I've showed. The building that Waiha designed was built exactly as they designed it. Um, the hotel at Bono is a building that had to uh, cantilever over the water because there wasn't enough sight and it had to be lightweight, but the design wasn't particularly driven by um, the fact that you know, it was going to be made modular. It's got to be invisible. It's got to be invisible and uh, widely adoptable. Uh, and it's a series of methodologies. It's not one thing fits all. Um, a lot of main contractors love the, the ability for the speed of construction, but owners still are asking about the expression of the external surface. Um, they're saying, if it's modular, do I have to see it as modular, as an expression? or? can in some way the modularization also uh, have a continuation of, of the surface that so it doesn't look like it's modular from exterior. And the second thing I think I'd maybe Phil and I, you touched on Nanda was um, as a just-in-time process now, um, what impacts do you think it's going to have on the construction industry and the procurement process in general? I mean, does now the modular, modular constructor become the main contractor? Um, do they become the all-in-one consultant? Um, be it that now you're sourcing a, a synergetic system rather than a sum of elemental parts. Uh, do you think that's going to have an impact on the way we're going to procure buildings? When it comes to something like uh, a curtain wall facade, a builder has got to um, do chop outs in a slab. You got to you got to you got to set it out. You have to put it in there. Then you have to fit brackets. The brackets have to move. Uh, laterally and vertically to take to take account of the the hugely inaccurate you know plus or minus 20 30 millimeters of of concrete construction um, we're setting up with, um, something that we take your brackets fitted to um, an edge of our floor and it arrives uh, integrated so that the builder doesn't have to do the do the uh, set downs uh, doesn't have to go back and grout it and then the other thing that happens is that 
given that our steel panels are steel, so we're working within millimetres, the accuracy that uh, we can place these things is uh, much, much greater than on a building. So we can take all that out. That's a very simple way to just bypass all that labour and all that double handling and all that complication. So I thought, you know, thinking small and thinking particular and getting rid of all these little problems it's an incremental process that leads to these efficiencies. It's not a great big, oh, we're going to make things uh, out of the CIMC boxes and that's the future. It's volumetric and we're going to make all our buildings like this and they're going to look the same. They won't look the same. The secret is to approach each problem, look at it and find a, um, a rational solution that you can do back in a manufacturing process rather than all these silly things that have to be done on site at the moment. The next question. Um, look, again, just to reiterate what Nanda has said and also, again, what he said in answer to the previous question, you know, that the, the, the other big change in modular is the ability to provide bespoke um, solutions. And, you know, so we're not constrained by 2.4, 2.7 or even 4 metre spans anymore with the, with the flat pack systems. You can now build a building that's the same as any other conventional building. Um, so... Uh, and, and yes, that can be done where facades and things become seamless. Um, your other part of the question was whether you know, the, the modular manufacturers will become the main contractors and even the designers. Um, I guess if I could just draw a, a few foundations and then put a line across the plan, modules by others, and send my invoice and collect a <laughs> cheque, um, that would be a good thing. But I, I don't think it's, it's going to happen. I think the, you know, the, the best... Uh, well, no, I can't be sure of that. But typically, the best designers don't live inside uh, the manufacturers. You get great specialists who live inside the, ma the manufacturers who, who can give us generalists great, great input and knowledge, but um, the, the best general designers don't, don't live inside the manufacturing process. When we do these tall buildings in the modular way, uh, the most important part is to build the core, you know, which gives the stability and uh, houses the vertical transportations, e elevators and... Uh, uh, staircases. I mean, well, we are doing staircases now in the precast ways, but uh, to build this core, you know, in a modular way and then integrate it with the other components of the building, which generally in many buildings we have seen that we can do it with the uh, steel structures or even uh, when I was doing some hospitality project we had done, we had explored the idea of uh, doing the container rooms as well. But the biggest challenge was coming in, uh, you know, the erection of the core, it has to go in the in situ way and then integrating it with the other parts of the building. Do you have any innovative ideas or technologies where we can integrate the core, you know, or build the core in the modular way? I mean, way back, uh, if I look at the example of, uh, uh, you know, the buildings in New York or Chicago, it's like Empire State, you know. We had certain integration, but I think nowadays people are not doing that. I mean, my question is why and is there is any other way? Possibly a question for Nanda, particularly yeah, look, um, about the cores, uh, cores are not particularly hard to do in, in panels. Um, office buildings, because they've got a central core and empty floor space, um, it's difficult to bypass the floor. But take, take a hotel, uh, take a residential building, uh, yes, they're stabilised by cores, but uh, you have to ask why. For instance, you can decentralise the lateral uh, structure by using, um, um, say, party walls between apartments. You can have a whole series of walls, um, you know, every, you know, sort of 10, 12, 15 metres, wherever they occur, and use the whole body of the building to lateral restraint, not some concrete structure that's, uh, that's centralised. But again, you have to look at it pro uh, project by project. We have looked at cores, we've looked at pre prefabricated uh, stair systems because we're very interested in doing a holistic thing. If it's, uh, we believe you can apply, you can prefabricate most buildings to a much greater degree than is currently being uh, done by a system of flat plaques, volumetric, um, you know, st conventional steel structure, the whole, the whole lot. The objective is to be flexible and look things from per first principles, but cores are very much on our um, agenda. If, if I could just add to that, that, certainly that one we did in Darwin did have a modular core, 
you, you could call it that. Uh, it was concrete, um, but it was made, uh, parts of it were made on site, but they were made on the ground in a controlled condition. Uh, it was heavily voided to keep the weight down so it could be picked up by the crane and put in position and then um, without any formwork being needed, um, reinforcement and the rest of the concrete were, were positioned afterwards. And that was designed so that it could go six floors ahead of the modules if that's the way you wanted to go as with conventional construction. It was also designed so it could go behind the modules if the modules arrived more quickly than you expected and you, you, you had them somewhere and you needed to put them up, um, they could go first. So we disconnected the sequence between the core and the modules just to give ultimate flexibility in the way the building got built. Um, wasn't particular, what's the word? It worked for that remote market in Darwin, which is also cyclonic, where we had a lot of, a lot of wind load. Um, but we could also put a 65 tonne crane on that site, uh, which you wouldn't get in a lot of developed, developed cities. Um, so again, a bespoke solution that worked for one site might not work anywhere else again. When uh, Phil was speaking actually, and you were saying about uh, timber construction, so although it is obviously one of the more uh, well established in some ways, also some of the innovations that we see starting to come through, uh, CLT, um, mm. so cross laminated timber, other applications, um, and so you're able to construct your core out of timber, out of prefabricated panels, and that's obviously inherently a lot more uh, integrated into the rest of the building. So I think absolutely there's ways of, of doing that, um, but like you say, it probably needs to be more uh, looked into a bit more as well. Uh, in many parts of the world, the local authorities have a very strong influence over the engineering. And if it doesn't appear in a design standard, you can forget about it. What does the uh, modular world need to do to get a wider acceptance? This might almost be a question for Anthony, because yeah. I think, yes. the, I think okay. the, the handbook is one of the ways um, to, to do that, but you are going to have to get local authority acceptance of the standards that that's based on. But that, that, that handbook is not just based on one country's set of standards. Mm. It's drawn from Euro codes, American codes, Australian codes, New Zealand codes to pull, pull together what's, what's, what's the correct way uh, to do things. So, for instance, you know, uh, Anthony touched on progressive collapse, barely covered in the Australian standards. Um, so they went, went to the Euro codes for that. And that's, that's what we're trying to do now. So have it adopted with, say, New Zealand, Australia, obviously, um, other Asian countries, um, United States as well. Um, and if we can have a more general rollout and uh, well, probably a standardisation that's not common in structural engineering anyway, you usually do have uh, a lot of separate codes for each region. Um, yeah, being able to have that, uh, I guess, a common code for, for all of them should help, um, yeah, standardise designs, but then also, uh, help to collaborate between those regions because they're working off the same uh, set of standards. Anthony, it might be worth clarifying that the, the handbook that you've got a copy of is effectively, a, it's the first release and it's meant to be a live document that's in development and one of the reasons it was given to everybody at this conference is to get feedback and improve it and hopefully deal with those sort of situations so that all of, that, all of those questions can be addressed and it can be used internationally. Um, as uh, buildings get taller and you start to apply uh, modular techniques to them, would you see a trend in externalized building cores for ease of independent construction, maintenance, that sort of thing? In effect, uh, again, that, that's the way the one we, we, uh, we designed for Darwin. The core was pretty much external uh, and really only attached to a, to a corridor. Um, works in that climate because even at 30 levels we've got naturally ventilated corridors open to the atmosphere up there. It just gives a much better, much better environment in a, in a tropical humid, uh, humid condition. So that was one of the other reasons they were there. And also to stick the core on, uh, on the, the face with no, no views and other things. Look, certainly um, side cores, external cores, they're also good for conventional construction, but uh, you, can't always, you can't always get them to work. I think as Nanda says, it's a case-by-case -case basis. So um, you may have a project with other constraints which uh, require that it has a central core, or in other instances where it doesn't, then you can uh, have a side core or, or other ways of stabilising the, bu the building, as he says. Um, so yeah, there's obviously some freedom and uh, some impetus put back onto the actual designers to be able to uh, do that in a way which works best for whichever situation they're in. So we manufacture modular wiring systems and we're 
one of the contributors to the code for electrical sections of that. What uh, Phil was talking about before in, in your speech was uh, bang on with what we see, is it, people tend to hold the IP and uh, specialization in their own companies. And we're the same. We, we don't want, necessarily want to give away all that, but the, we're also part of, in the UK, the DFMA system and uh, protocols by Lang & Walk. So they use our systems and other systems there. And I see that as a big gap in Australia and New Zealand. So you, know, you, you made comments on this before. What do you think is the way to, to help that move forwards? Because I, I think that would help modular and construction move forwards. You're talking about getting people to release their IP? No, you, you sort of hinted on maybe people have this and it needs to be a collective. People need to work together or talk together. So bringing something like the lean process or DFMA process into a, a body or a, along the lines of what's been put together in the code, oh, sorry, the, the handbook, uh, do you think that it's likely or there's a way that we could do that? I think, um, I think it's increased collaboration a lot already. Um, there was a, the, the technical workshop on modular yesterday when James did present. Um, he, he very much emphasised the fact that there was a lot of collaboration between Lango Rourke, uh, Brookfield Multiplex and Lendlease already um, and that um, working together on these sort of standards and handbooks sort of promoted that sort of collaboration uh, and the sharing of intelligence um, solutions and problems and getting each other to help each other with problems too. So I think um, in much the same way that the CTBUH sponsors sharing of knowledge, you know, and cooperation between all sorts of people at events like this and, and otherwise through their research and papers, I think, just, you know, groups working on handbooks or, or getting together and, and working in industry organisations is one of the ways to get, get past that stuff for sure. I have a question. For, for Nanda, maybe it's a, uh, I want to know, I want to ask you if, uh, in your opinion, uh, which is the advantages from, for the final users uh, of modular construction? I ask this because, in my opinion, the perception of uh, modular construction in the market for the final users is one of the, of the most important issue for the modular construction to, to, to happen as a, as a future development of construction. Well, every technology, in a way, should be invisible. If, um, if an end user is going to live in an apartment that's built of bricks or built of concrete or built with uh, timber framing, or well, in the end, uh, they're, living in a, in, you know, they're sleeping in a bedroom, they're using a bathroom, and it all looks the same. With uh, modular construction, you can bring efficiencies. Look, we ultimately, we want to make it cheaper. We want to stop the escalating cost of prices. Of, uh, we want to use less labour. Uh, we want to use less materials, and we want to use um, a, a, a more a less carbon emitting sort of technology. We've got, um, we've got in our in the UBE structures. There's uh, we're using 50% of the concrete, the cement that you would use in in a normal building. Uh, we're looking to increase the fly ash content to you know, 60, 70% with borrow. Our, our, um, we can get, um, we can uh, eliminate concrete pouring on site, that's another goal, and some of the buildings have reduced concrete pours by you know, 80, 80 plus percent. So all these things, uh, the end users being part of a society that has to move away from carbon intensive um, technologies, that's a benefit, that's a, that's a social benefit. But individually, uh, our wall systems in apartments are full of foam cement, which are better insulation acoustically. We've eliminated voids in our structures because working, uh, talking to people in the Middle East and um, Malaysia, Singapore, humid areas, um, it protects the steel structures. All those things um, are benefits, and there's no disbenefit in terms of the quality. If you have a good builder, you have good materials, there's no disbenefit, and all these other associated um, benefits for end units. But technology is basically invisible. Most people don't know what's behind the coat of paint on the plasterboard. So, Nandri, if I walked into the Crown Plaza, would I be able to tell it was modular? The Crown Plaza. Uh, no. no, no, there'd be no. There would be no. It was designed by leading architects. It was executed and built according to their designs and specifications. 
It met uh, all the acoustic and regulatory uh, requirements in terms of uh, you know, fire, exits, acoustics, all the things that we were the testing. The bathrooms were tested in a way that Singapore does it. They had to be flooded and uh, left for a few days, all that sort of So we met all the requirements. We jumped all the hurdles. It is the technology is invisible and complying. Do you think that regulations uh, that are, are like the Euro codes we have in the Netherlands, Europe, we have a euro code for concrete, we have one for steel, we have one for timber, we have one for seismic stuff, etc. all kinds of euro codes. Do you think that new materials in construction could help modular building? And is there, is there a constraint there because there are no regulations to those new materials? Architects and specifiers uh, choose the materials, not the manufacturer. Uh, the modular manufac well, uh, manufacturer is the producer who, who will follow the specifications, the orders from the, uh, the engineers and the architects. Uh, we have been able to introduce, uh, especially with concrete, uh, we're using foam cements in combination with structural concrete to reduce the amount of um, weight and reduce the amount of uh, materials that go into a building by being quite specific, putting the things where they need to, to be put to achieve a, a structural result. But um, innovative materials, they can be incorporated um, in, whatever, in whatever building is, is specified. The modular producer is not really the leader in those processes. I'm really interested in the game changer question because we've seen from the historic context you know, a lineage of thinking. And it seems to me that the great inhibitor is spatial, actually, when you're dealing with volumetric. It's what fits on the back of a truck or on the back of a boat. So the question here is, what is the game changer in terms of material technology, energy technologies? And the example, of course, being in avionics or aviation, the A380 aircraft, through the technology of the skin of the aircraft. That enabled the plane to get much larger and we're seeing the evidence of the game changer in aviation. So the question here is, do you guys see a game changer in terms of modular construction from a technology point of view? Um, the the uh, volumetric boxes that we designed were monocoque structures that mm. uh, the whole thing worked as a, as, a, as a torsional box and it was able to span very long distances and carry big weights because essentially the walls were three meter deep trusses in effect. Uh, that has one sort of application. The flat pack stuff that the Phil talked about probably des describes our panels. Um, there's the, the, the game will be changed incrementally through a whole lot of little things. There is nothing big, glamorous, oh my God, look at this patented uh, superb solution to our construction problems. It's not the nature of how things get done in the, in the industry. So just look for a whole lot of little changes and talented people making you know, clever decisions that will lead construction away from the on-site factory and into you know, the covered workshop of manufacturing where you will be able to uh, realise all the benefits and all the efficiencies that doing things several times over. You know, on a building site, you do it once and you leave, you go to another one. These, in a manufacturing place, they hone this, they hone their product. They, they are able to develop uh, things that becomes, and the driver is economic. So ultimately, you can put more people, more roofs over people's heads by making, making, uh, achieving these efficiencies instead of, you know, there's a, there's a crisis in housing, there's a crisis in costs because those productivity graphs reflect, you know, manufactured items come down in cost. You know, solar panels, telephones, anything. Um, construction just is flatline and it goes up with inflation and other costs. So what you could buy in construction, you know, 50, 60 years ago, you can't buy for the same amount by a long shot now. That's the real driver to these, um, to making the construction industry more competitive, more cost effective and giving people, you know, as I say, roofs over their heads. I think, Nanda, even if you do try and work out what those technologies are going to be or what is going to change the current state of construction, uh, it's very difficult to look much further uh, into the future than what we already know, what we can already see as being technologies. So like Phil's saying, we go through the entire process of, of all these changes over history, but um, the real 
or maybe there's no one big game changer, but what actually comes up and, and what the construction industry looks like in 20, 30, you know, 100 years' time, I don't think there's any way of knowing what that really looks like, but you just need to be open-minded to uh, small changes now and how that's going to affect uh, where we end up in in the future. Yeah, just, just on that, I don't, you know, we do, we have carbon fibre, you know, we have, you know, there's ductile, which is a sort of 200, 300 MPA sort of concrete material. None of them are, they're all, all good for specialist uses, but not economic for general use. So I haven't seen anything that I think is a, a new material on the market. We're just seeing improvements in the materials we've been using for 100 plus years. But the real game changer is intelligent systems. Um, and, you know, the ability to, to handle data, manipulate data and, and, and use it to do things, you know, which is one of yours who asked a question before, you know, he'll be, his, his company will be at the front end of integrating design through, through manufacturer, I'm sure, sometime in the future. So, and that keeps, gets the, you know, that, that lack of uh, increasing productivity is all due to the human part. And um, so the game changer is um, unfortunately eliminating us. Mm -hmm.